Good evening and welcome. My name is Andrea Whitsett, and I am proud to be a board member of the Arizona Foundation for Women. And I want to thank you for joining us for this evening's She Talk event. Tonight's topic is navigating childcare during COVID-19. We know childcare is a timely and a critical issue facing people today, and we are fortunate to have two experts from the field joining us. Cindy Lenhoff, she is the director of the National Child Care Association, and Nicole Newhouse, who is the CEO of the Association for Support of Child Care. She Talks is a series of events that raise awareness on issues affecting the safety, health, and economic empowerment of women. While we normally hold these events in person, we are pleased to be able to make this series now available virtually. The mission of Arizona Foundation for Women is advancing the status of Arizona's women through research, advocacy, and philanthropy to ensure their safety, health, and economic independence. I want to thank our event partner, the Arizona Small Business Association. We appreciate having the opportunity to plan this event with an organization that provides numerous resources for Arizona entrepreneurs and small business owners. And you will hear more from them shortly. I also want to thank our event sponsors, Kefi Catalyst, Rosenden, Southwest Airlines, and SRP. Their logos are at the bottom of your screen and you can click them to link to their websites. At Arizona Foundation for Women, we hear from people on a daily basis both men and women asking, how can I get more involved? And there are many ways. Uh, first, you can become a member of AFW. So for as little as $10 a month, you connect your giving power with like-minded Arizonans who are leading the fight so that every woman in Arizona can change what is possible for her, her community, and future generations. We have numerous volunteer opportunities available if you have time to give including serving on committees and helping plan events. We also have the SHE Partners Program, where we collaborate with corporations throughout the Valley. So if your company has a women's affinity group, we would be very interested in speaking with you for more engagement opportunities. For more information on ways to get involved, please visit our website by clicking on the AFW logo at the bottom, or sorry, the top of your screen. On behalf of AFW, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Welcome everyone. Thank you, Andrea, for starting us off and to all of you for taking the time to be here with us today. My name is Kathleen Mascarenas. I am a media relations representative with Salt River Project. SRP is a strong and proud partner of the Arizona Small Business Association. At SRP, we know that COVID-19 has seriously impacted large businesses in the state and the small business community in equal measure. Recognizing how important our small businesses are to the overall health and vibrancy of the Arizona economy, we partnered with the Arizona Small Business Association to bring this information to our business owners who are not only struggling to run a business, but also navigate child care during these unprecedented times. Now at SRP, we work to keep the lights on, our customers happy, and the economy and community thriving. We are grateful for the opportunity to bring such relevant content to business owners, large and small. Together, SRP and ASBA are committed to helping businesses in Arizona recover and return stronger than before. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our expert speakers, Cindy Lenhoff, Director of National Child Care Association, and Nicole Newhouse, CEO of the Association for Supportive Child Care. Cindy has had 36 years of experience as a provider of early care and education. She's a former board member of the National Child Care Association and served on the National Early Childhood Program Accreditation Board for more than 15 years. Nicole is a management professional with 28 years of experience in executive leadership, finance and operations management, and new business fund development. She is serving on the Board of Treasurer for Arizona Autism United as Vice President of Ways and Means for the National Charity League, as well as serving via Montessori School as a member of the Capital Campaign Cabinet and the founder and initial president of Via Montessori's parent-teacher organization. Both Cindy and Nicole's contact information is located on the right side of your screen and in their bios. They will be emailed to you following today's conversation. So please welcome me in joining Cindy Lenhoff. 
Good evening. I want to start out by just thanking the Arizona Foundation for Women for inviting me to share with you some information about navigating childcare during the COVID-19 pandemic. I want to thank all of you for joining us. I wish I could tell you that we have had the opportunity to establish an easy process that would help you navigate childcare during this unprecedented time. However, I know that all of you are well aware that we've been learning and doing at the same time in a fast changing home and work environment. I'm gonna share some of what I've learned with you that I hope will help you either as a parent or an employer uh, with employees that need childcare, uh, know some of the things to look for and some of the facts that are available to help you in your decision. Uh, we recognize that each person and each family have a different circumstance and a different set of needs. And I will be talking mostly about licensed child care centers. And I know that uh, Nicole has some other, <clears throat> excuse me, um, some other uh, opportunities for possibly addressing child care needs in a different way. First of all, uh, I'm sure most of you, as I have been as a grandmother, uh, wondering about how many cases of COVID in children uh, there have actually been. And I will tell you, it's, it's very difficult to find this information. It's not really readily available, and it's basically bits and pieces. But I think in the bits and pieces, it gives you a little information about uh, the fact that it is not as widespread in children, thankfully, as it is in adults. And I can also recommend to you how to drill down a little bit and find out about your individual county or community as to what is happening um, that may help you decide whether to use a child care center or not. First of all, I, I have a report that has been being compiled and it's updated every day from the American Academy of Pediatrics and Children's Hospital Association. And what that report is telling us is that currently there are 76 million children in the United States. The number of COVID-19 cases that have been reported to them comes to about 242,000 to date. That boils down to there being an average of about 319 cases per 100,000 children. There have also been some other surveys and facts and figures that have been published and put out by other organizations that I did wanna share with you. Just again, so you can kind of get a feel for how this how this looks in the United States as it pertains to children in childcare settings. And this is a combination of childcare homes, licensed or registered, and licensed childcare. There was a survey that was provided by Brown University to NPR recently. And in that survey, 916 centers participated across the United States, caring for more than 20,000 children. And they reported just over 1% of their staff and only 0.16% or 32 children were confirmed with the virus in the last few months. Another statistic is that during the lockdown, the YMCA set up emergency sites for children ages one to 14 for essential employees across the United States. Um, this was done because so many childcare centers were closing and with the school districts closing, there was a greater need for school age children. And so at this point, um, they were only able to record, uh, well, the way it was worded, uh, the statistic, uh, excuse me, out of 1,100 sites, there were no records of having more than one case at a site. So while that's vague, it still gives you an idea. There are states that are doing a better job than many in reporting COVID 
uh, in licensed child care settings. And again, that includes centers and family child care homes. Texas, for example, one of our largest states and also a state where there are uh, has been a, a huge increase in COVID. Um, there were 1,799 reported cases of COVID-19 through uh, Monday of this week among their 12,220 to open licensed childcare operations. And out of that, about 1,200 staff and almost 600 children in 1,000 of those centers, a little over 1,000, uh, centers had contacted COVID. In California, again, another state, large state that has um, had a lot of COVID incidents and it's been on the rise, they have had 1,365 reported cases of COVID-19, and that is among parents, staff, and children. And this is throughout 33,000 opened licensed childcare operations. And out of those, only 261 of these are children. In North Carolina, they're reporting what they call clusters in childcare settings. So a cluster is defined as a group of five or more cases. So there are currently 14 clusters in childcare with a total of 103 cases among the state's 6,485 licensed childcare settings. And I, and I hope this helps you see that to date, it has been very minimal. And unfortunately, Arizona, I cannot find any data at this time um, that is similar to the other states that I have given to you as examples. And again, these are states with a lot of COVID-19 um, cases, and uh, but limited as far as children's cases um, that are being reported. One of the things, though, that I would recommend if you are looking at a child care setting, whether it be a family child care home or center, is to contact your local health department because the local health departments are the point of contact for child care providers. They must call and report an incident of COVID in a child or a staff member. And in some cases, they also have to contact child care licensing but it is the local and state health departments that are giving direction for what to do when there is a case of COVID. And in most cases, the classroom that the COVID cases occurred in is shut down for, up, uh, for a thorough cleaning and doesn't reopen for anywhere from four to 14 days, depending upon what each individual local health department um, is advising the center to do. If you are looking at a childcare setting, and this is going to be more prevalent in licensed childcare settings, which can be a family childcare home or a childcare center, there are certain tried and true things that they should be doing that they should be able to uh, tell you. And I, I wouldn't ask them directly if they're doing them. I wouldn't you know, give them the opportunity to say yes or no. I would ask them what they're doing to prevent to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And these are the things that should easily come to mind and uh, be told to you. Uh, first of all, they should be implementing an arrival screening process for staff and children. And that screening process starts out with a temperature being taken. If a temperature is more than 100.4 degrees upon arrival, the children or the staff member are sent home and they're not able to return until that, that uh, temperature goes away. Um, typically in childcare, it's, it's 101, but the CDC has recommended it be lowered to 1.4 degrees. The other thing that should be done immediately after the temperature has been taken of either a staff or a child is they should wash their hands thoroughly for the 20 seconds that we're all hearing is the recommendation. And just so you know, we have been washing our hands in childcare settings for 20 seconds for as long as I can remember. We actually teach young children to sing happy birthday twice because that's how long it takes for uh, uh, the 20 seconds to occur while they're washing their hands. 
The other thing is you should be looking, uh, they should be telling you that they are limiting who can enter the center and under what conditions. Centers that are really working hard to prevent the spread of COVID are not allowing parents into the school. They greet the parent and the child at the door or right inside the office if it is completely separate from classrooms and the child is taken from there. In traditional childcare, parents are encouraged to come in and drop their child off and say and, and leave messages with the teacher. Um, but now that's not occurring. Messages are left at the front door. The other restriction should also be visitors. There really should be no tours of the center uh, during business hours. Uh, providers should be giving virtual tours or giving tours after hours when children have already gone home. Because again, those of you that have uh, are familiar with childcare, uh, parents tour centers to choose, you know, to make the best choice for their family. There should also be huge limitations on anyone that can enter the building or enter a classroom. Uh, the only exceptions should be known people such as maybe a facilities person that calls on the center. And even then it would be best if, well, one, that person would have to undergo the same screening process and the washing of hands. They should uh, wear gloves and a mask. And if at all possible, if they're having to do something in a classroom, like change a filter or you know, tighten a doorknob, the children should go outside or arrangements, arrangements can be made for those things to be done at night versus during the day. Uh, they sh child care uh, providers should also be having a much stricter requirements about children and staff with any symptoms of, of illness. You know, we all know that allergies can cause a runny nose, but we also know that COVID can cause a runny nose. And so uh, it really should be occurring that uh, the slightest symptoms should of ch in a child or a staff, they should be sent home and cleared by a doctor to return. Uh, they should also be implementing a policy that addresses staff, parents, and children that travel out of town. Um, the health departments are recommending uh, anywhere from four to 14 days for someone that, ha someone that has traveled out of town to come back into the building. This is a hard one to track because not everybody is honest, uh, but I think that most people are very conscientious about not wanting their, their child to get sick. And so um, people are telling me that parents are keeping their children home if they choose to travel out of town, especially to a state um, that has uh, a high number of occurrences. We also in childcare, based on CDC guidelines, have intensified cleaning and, and disinfecting um, in our schools. Uh, it, clean and safe has have always been a, a, a topic that is high on the list of what parents expect of child care. And then of course, we're regulated by the health department and child care licensing. So um, it's nothing for them to come in and check to see if we are cleaning and sanitizing and what products we're using to make sure they kill germs. But now instead of cleaning a bathroom twice a day, it's cleaned multiple times a day. And, and typically used to doorknobs and light pictures and things like that were cleaned once a week. Now they're cleaned three to four times a day. Any areas that can be touched are cleaned often. Um, it has actually increased the cost um, for the child care provider, the amount of cleaners that they are using and the staff, the additional staff to do it. But everyone is committed that that is doing this uh, the right way is committed to doing it because no one wants a child to become ill or a staff member. Um, there's also some very clear guidelines on there are certain toys that should be removed if you have any kind of cloth toys, such as dress up items or baby dolls with cloth bellies, those should be removed. There, this is just not a time where those can be used because they can't be clean and sanitized after each use. And so at this point, after a child uses a toy, it should be put up and clean and sanitized before it's returned, which is also requiring providers to have plenty of equipment that they can transition out through the day. 
As far as social distancing, there are techniques that are appropriate to young children. It is very difficult to keep children, young children six feet apart. However, many providers have chosen to run smaller groups of children in classrooms. Some states are even requiring it. It just depends on what state you live in as to whether the government has said you can only run at 50% capacity or two thirds capacity. So it automatically increases the amount of space to a given number of children. Um, classrooms can also be arranged in a way that creates small centers so that uh, one child is in one area at a time and then when that child moves to another area, the area, the table, chair, everything is, is clean and sanitized. And again, hand washing is done multiple times a day in a child care center. In fact, any time a child transitions from one area to another, they should do a thorough hand washing. Same with the staff. Um, and that is the last one, is implementing a hand washing process that ensures that young children are doing it routinely and correctly. Again, because licensed child care settings, whether they be family homes or child care centers, um, the, the rule throughout the country in every licensing book I've ever read is that children must be within sight and sound at all times. So when your child is washing their hands, there's an adult standing there or should be standing there uh, before COVID and definitely during COVID to make sure that those hands are being washed routinely. And in childcare, we've been taught that is the tried and true way to keep the spread of disease at, at a limit and, and to keep it from spreading as fast as it might in an environment where children are building immune systems. So again, I just want to close what I have to say uh, about navigating is that this is a, a choice that is different for every family. And again, it's also different for every geography because if you are living in a geography where you know COVID is uh, really spreading and, and there's been many, many cases, that's gonna increase the chance of a person getting it and even a, a childcare teacher getting it or a, a child. And so uh, that's gonna be a different decision for somebody probably living in Miami, Florida, um, then, and also even in some counties of Arizona. And there is, um, I would reference you to the uh, health department website, just type in Arizona Health Department, because they do show maps of where COVID is uh, more widespread. And you can actually find out by zip code, uh, you know, what is happening and if there are a number of children in those particular areas that are being infected. So I hope this helps you in that decision. Now I'm gonna turn this over to Nicole because she has some other thoughts to share with you. Thank you so much, Cindy. Uh, that was really great information. I also wanted to reiterate my thanks to the Arizona Foundation for Women and the Arizona Small Business Association. Um, I am sure that anybody that is listening tonight um, has had to struggle and has been sitting in struggle and figuring out how to navigate childcare in the middle of a global pandemic, particularly if you have those littles and are working. It's tough to juggle and it's been tough for, for many people. I just wanted to touch on a few stats from the state of Arizona. Um, and it, 50, about 50% 50 of licensed centers across the state have closed. At this point, a little bit more than that are open. Of those opening, they're operating at less than 50% capacity. In fact, I got some information today that um, indicates that programs, childcare programs in the state are operating at 38% of what they were doing pre-COVID. So the childcare industry is in great struggle. Uh, they don't make a lot of money to begin with and without children, they're not getting tuition and without tuition, they are at this point about 40% of programs have had to lay off or furlough staff. That said, there are plenty of people that have had to get to work um, and the state has created enrichment centers 
for those that have been in need of care. I think some of the interesting, uh, if not sad statistics is 2% of the programs are permanently closed. I don't have the information on where those are, but in our state, we have a not insignificant number of what are called childcare deserts, places in our state where there's inadequate care provided for children. Uh, and with 2% closing, that's a real challenge. Um, so while I recognize that we as parents, as working parents have been in struggle, the childcare industry has been in great struggle as well. But from our vantage point, one of the things we have to think about is to go or to not go, to send our kids or not to send our kids. And I don't know about any of y'all, but things change in, in our household at the speed of uh, headline news. Um, with the rapidly changing landscape and understanding of this no novel virus, I think we all sit in a different space where we're reflecting on whether or not to send our kids. And that has to do with a lot of factors. Um, and I just want to touch on a, a few of them. One of them is our work obligations. Um, the age and maturity of our kids relative to our work obligations and whether we can manage it. I think Cindy mentioned that if you are going to be at home with a little, having a schedule, um, making time, working early, working late, but some of us don't have the ability to do that. Our personal finances, uh, health and safety, both of us, our kids, and frankly, the teachers. And then um, our, the social emotional needs of kids. I think Cindy also touched on the fact that the littles, as long as they're getting attention and love and focus on them, they're fine. But you get a little older, three, four, five. Uh, and then for those of you that may have school age children on up, they're missing their friends. And so that, that really plays a part in whether or not we're going to dispatch them into a childcare setting. So I'm not sure of those that are listening if uh, you've run into a situation where your childcare uh, situation had closed down and you're searching. And I don't know if you all do what I did when I was searching for childcare, which is talking to my friends and you know, get the, the grapevine. But what most people don't know is that there is um, a service it's called the Child Care Resource and Referral Service. It's a database. Um, and that database, and I here on the slide, there's the website. You can search for child care in your area. Um, it, can, it will provide, if it's enrolled in what is called the Quality First Program, it will show um, what the quality rating is of the site. Um, the address and whether or not that you've, they've got the capacity. So that's a really important uh, resource in order to discover childcare. The other thing that's popping up, and it's been around for a very long time, but there are alternative choices to traditional care. Um, what a lot of people don't know is close to 70% of kids birth to five across the nation, and it certainly holds true here in the state of Arizona, are not enrolled, have never been enrolled in licensed childcare. They've been taken care of informally by family, friends, and neighbors, um, whether it's Nana that has the capacity to take care of the, the kids or your next door neighbor or your sister um, or somebody from school. Family, friends, and neighbors is, has been a place where we have seen an inordinate amount of growth during the time of the pandemic where children are being cared for. Um, and I, I mean, even amongst you all, I would imagine that if you have not felt comfortable, you have had some other alternative. And if you've had to be at work, you've come, you've run into what those alternatives are. Um, people are also, as the school year is starting to commence, coming up with micro schools where they identify people who are in what they would consider their safe bubble people who have behaved similarly to them. And it almost operates like a human services co-op where children are going from home to home in order to give parents an opportunity to work um, while they're at somebody else's home. So there's a vast amount of things that we can be doing as we're reflecting 
on whether to send our kids or not. When I sit in reflection of the ingredients that have to go into the meat grinder of determining whether or not to send our kids to, to a childcare setting, the first thing is where we sit in terms of risk tolerance, where our family is, our family circumstances. Do we have anybody in, in our, in our homes that are of higher risk? Um, and that plays into the health and safety of teachers, our kids and ourselves. Um, I can tell you that of the 34% of childcare sites in the state that have remained closed, um, one of the biggest barriers to reopening um, is A, parents' unwillingness to bring their kids in because of health and safety, and staff being unwilling to come back because of their health and safety. So this is something that, that's gonna play into our decisions. Our physical space, um, if your home is so small that you're, you have no ability, I don't know if you guys saw that one newscast where there was a, a news reporter that was doing a live feed and his child who was in a walker came through the door and I think his wife came running in scurrying and trying to pull it out. If your home is so small that you can't focus on work, that is going to play into the decision. Uh, our finances, work demands, and frankly, time and data as new information becomes available about this, this novel coronavirus. Um, so that is what I wanted to share. I think Cindy covered a lot of the material on what we should be assessing inside child care centers. I just wanted to go through from a parent's perspective the things that we could be reflecting on. But I do really look forward to um, what's coming up in what I hope is going to be a really robust conversation in Q&A. Good evening, I'm Maureen Busoletti, the Vice Chair of the Board for the Arizona Foundation for Women. I really wanna take this opportunity to thank both Cindy and Nicole for their expertise and for all of the valuable information they shared. And we do wanna continue the dialogue. And so as you registered for this uh, tonight's event, you had an opportunity to submit questions in advance, and we do want to cover a few of those now. So I'm going to direct the first question to Nicole. Uh, and Nicole, you mentioned the Child Care Resource and Referral Center. I actually used that when my kids were small, so I was glad to hear you mention that. But is there a central resource within Arizona that parents can go to that summarizes facilities by cost, availability, the precautions that they're taking for COVID, et cetera? And can you speak to or recap some of the core steps that parents should take when they're thinking about uh, child care during this time? Absolutely. Maureen, I wish I had a better answer for you. CCRNR is the largest database of child care centers. Unfortunately, it does not list things like cost. And as Cindy shared, there's no place where it's being consolidated on um, infections. But it is the best database that we have in the state. Uh, as a recap to what Cindy shared in terms of assessing the safety of a center, the, the first question that I would ask is, are there other adults um, permitted on campus? Um, how are they screening the children? How are they screening the teachers? How are they disinfecting um, the site? Um, what is, and Cindy spent some time talking about this as well, what are the practices in terms of social distancing? Uh, and is there a difference between the age groups um, so does that mean they're going to change the ratios? Uh, how are they going to handle the infant room versus uh, the three-year-old room? Who's got PPE? Um, and, you know, one of the things that we, we didn't talk about, but with all of this focus on health and safety, one of the things, a couple of things that I would want to make sure I inquired about is teachers are going to be necessarily a little neurotic. Um, I'd want to know a little bit about what the child teacher engagement is um, because they're going to be pretty focused on making sure everybody's clean and keeping safe. But we do want to make sure that there's a high quality um, program going on. So that child teacher engagement is something that I'd want to inquire about. And then finally, what are the supports for the teachers? Um, 
I mean, this is a stressful time for them as well, and I'd want to make sure that there are things in place that the program is doing to support those teachers. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, Cindy, to you, is there data that suggests that toddlers will be at a significant disadvantage if parents do decide to opt out of childcare or preschool for months at a time due to COVID? You know, research has, you know, always shown us that there's pros and cons to uh, children being in childcare, and there's pros and cons to children being cared for in their in their home, you know, by a parent. And I think that in this day and time, the thing that should take precedent over, you know, anything is, is the health and safety of the child and your comfort level with that child, with your child being in a health, healthy and safe environment. And if you aren't confident of that, uh, certainly uh, I, I don't think people should worry because again, research has shown that things can be done at home, you know, that can't be done at childcare. There's more one-on-one -on -one time at home with a child. Certainly uh, social, socialization, um, is uh, something that children can develop more uh, readily in a child care setting. Um, and right now there's a lot of isolation for, for all of us. So socialization is, is not top of mind. And, and you know, if parents want to continue to, uh, you know, read to their young children and take time out for, to play some games and go outside, and do the things that you know that children do experience in childcare. It's not going to be a huge mess. It, it, it's going to be okay, and it would not be what I would worry about. Yeah. Um, so, kind of a related follow-up question. I know this is a, a top area of concern for a lot of parents, but if you are a parent or a caregiver, do you have any recommendations on how to balance having your kids do? online preschool, but at the same time then balancing working from home? Well, um, I would not really um, push online preschool too much <laughs> because online preschool is a lot of screen time. And in most cases, we don't recommend more than about 30 minutes a day for screen time. However, um, you know, we, there can be exceptions in situations like this, but young children change and uh, what they're doing, you know, five, 10 minutes at a time. And so uh, parents have to understand that uh, there's going to be interruptions to their day. And when that happens, they're going to have to just stop and deal with it. It'll take a lot more energy to fight it than it will be to stop and manage you know, the situation. More than anything, I would say to parents, establish a routine of who's going to do what, when, and stick very closely with that routine because children do best. Young children especially do best when they know what's coming next and when to expect it. And we find that transitions in child care settings go much smoother when we have working time at the same time every day. When we uh, go outside at the same time every day, when we have an academic um, activity or an art experience at the same time every day. Keeping in mind, though, that on occasion, flexibility is required uh, with young children. And you have to go with their flow and you really have to know when you can and when you can't stay within that routine. But I would say get back to it as soon as you can if there's an interruption. And always have plenty of snacks. <laughs> snacks. <laughs> so I heard a routine, flexibility, breaks, and the all-important snacks. <laughs> yes. um, yeah. So Nicole, I'm back to you. Do you have any recommendations to provide to parents who opt out right now of a daycare or preschool due to COVID, but to avoid losing their spot when they need to return uh, eventually to work and want to take advantage of those programs? I think that's a great question. Um, I think one of the ways is to have a conversation with the center director to see if you could hold your spot by paying perhaps 50% or a portion of your tuition. Um, those centers don't want to lose you any more than you want to lose the spot. 
uh, largely because of the, the tenuous financial situation that they're in. Um, I think that that would be the first recommendation, maybe the best recommendation to hold the spot. Um, absent that, I, I don't know that spots are going to be a challenge uh, unless your center is one of those unfortunate ones that are permanently closing. Um, with these sites only serving 38% of the kids they were before, I think that there is a much bigger supply of spots uh, than there is of demand for them at this point, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so on a related note, I, uh, affordable childcare is always a concern. I don't know if you're seeing or have any data that suggests that cost for childcare is increasing, right? As daycare centers are kind of struggling with financial stability. I have not seen any data that suggests that the prices are going up at this point. I think uh, if I were to use my intuitions over the data that I have, every child care center is fighting for survival. Um, there is legislation that's being proposed um, in order to uh, allocate more dollars to child care centers. I think that the pandemic has proven something that many of us have known for a long time, but I think um, from a policy perspective, it's becoming more aware, more meaningful to people. Childcare is essential. Our economy does not work when we do not have safe, high quality places for our children to learn, grow and thrive. Um, so no, I have not seen any indication that they're going to be raising their prices. Uh, that doesn't mean that it won't happen in, in pursuit of um, trying to survive. Thank you. We're going to turn a little bit to some questions related to daycare center and providers. Uh, Cindy, what are the protocols or are there standards for daycare centers or programs? Uh, closure, notification to parents, et cetera, if there's a positive COVID case in either a child or a provider or a family member? Well, first of all, the child care center must report to their local health department. And in some cases, they also have to report to their child care licensing department as well. But what I found in researching this and in talking with providers across the United States is that the health department is the primary uh, contact. And then it is my understanding that the health department will gather the names and uh, phone numbers, even though there is a possibility of confidentiality uh, being questioned, but in this case, uh, it really is necessary. Uh, health department, uh, in many cases, takes the names and phone numbers of anyone that has had a direct exposure and contacts them uh, personally. But again, we are also seeing the industry itself, you know, they want parents as much as they don't, you know, want to have a COVID case, they also don't want to have more COVID cases. And so um, I, I just have not heard of anyone not being forthright um, with the situation and making sure that their parents also hear it from them. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and Nicole, we're learning that um, COVID is not most likely not uh, contracted or contacted by services. So we talked a little bit earlier, Cindy, Cindy talked about sanitation of toys. Um, are there recommendations for classrooms regarding Play-Doh or use of water play, et cetera? Um, well, I think centers are typically trying to provide individual stations um, to avoid contamination. Uh, water tables are easily separated with personal buckets uh, same for other sensory material like sand. Um, as, as Cindy mentioned, kids are, are being asked to wash their hands prior to playing with those items, um, as well as after. Play-Doh is easily made and can be given to each child um, for their own personal use. Uh, and then toys, as, as Cindy shared, can, can and should be washed and sanitized after each use. Um, so that, that's my take on what's going on with materials for the children. Thank you. Hey, Cindy, um, do you have any tips or recommendations back to this financial stability for daycare centers or providers to build or overcome financial instability right now? 
Well, um, I do. Um, at this point, I, I want to, and this goes back to a little bit about what Nicole was talking about. Um, back in uh, the first part of April, the CARES Act was passed by our Congress, and it actually provided uh, uh, PPP loans to small businesses, and many of our child care centers are small businesses. In fact, 90 uh, approximately 93% of the licensed child care providers in the United States are small businesses. And many are led by women, um, as you might expect. And so um, they uh, providers could apply for a loan that could transition to a grant if you provided the documentation and how you used it. Um, it provided enough money for uh, the child care center to pay their staff for eight and a half weeks, and that was one of the criteria is that we kept people employed. And then you could also use it towards rent. Um, and there were some other caveats, but pretty much what people got covered their payroll and maybe some of their rent. Um, so that that helped. However, that money is, is running out. I understand there's still some left. Um, so they could contact their small business administration about the PPP loans for small businesses. And they can also contact their lender because every bank, uh, everyone was doing the lending. And again, those transition very easily to grants so you're not having to pay back as long as you prove uh, what you, you know, that you used it for the purpose it was intended. Um, Actually, Arizona received 88 million additional dollars uh, from the CARES Act. Uh, there was 3.5 billion additional dollars uh, by this legislation put into the Child Care Block Grant, and that money was dispersed to states based on uh, the data and the amount of money they receive under normal circumstances. So for Arizona, that was 88 um, million dollars. And the agency that distributes this fund funding um, is typically uh, the Department of Human Services. I think in, uh, and, and Nicole, I think in Arizona, is it the Department of uh, Economic, oh. Department of Economic Security, DES. Yes, thank you. It, it's it's mm -hmm. so many different things. It's D, DCF, D, DHS, um, and but it's uh, DES in Arizona. So a provider could contact uh, DES to find out how that money is being uh, used to support centers that are open. Again, some of it's through grants, some of it's through uh, higher reimbursement uh, for uh, children um, in care at this time uh, to cover some of the absences because one of the things that's causing, you know, uh, providers to uh, uh, not have enough to operate is that if there aren't children in attendance, and especially those that are covered by subsidy, there's no payment made, but rent is still due. So that would be my advice. And there is new legislation, in fact, uh, yesterday, uh, in, a, in an unprecedented move, the House of Representatives passed um, a $50 billion uh, child care relief bill. It now goes to the Senate. And uh, we, we believe that while that amount may not hold, we will still um, see a large relief package that will be uh, hammered out between the Senate and the House. And again, Arizona and every state, that will be uh, funneled through the child care grant grant, through DES, and that will uh, bring additional dollars to every state to help their child care centers. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, hey, Nicole, are there any resources or recommendations that you can provide to 501Cs that are seeking grants to provide literacy or education for working parents in rural areas? That's a great question. The first place I would recommend is um, Read On Arizona, uh, which is an organization that's dedicated to uh, expanding literacy across the state. In terms of grant making organizations, as, as many nonprofits are aware at this point, funders are assessing how best to spend their dollars. 
But what I would recommend is having conversations with Arizona Community Foundation, where individual donors can earmark dollars um, to allocate towards those types of projects, as well as I would connect with the United Way in that community in order to see if there's anything, because a lot of the United Ways are rallying around education of, of children at this point. So those would be my recommendations. Thank you. We had a, a comment from uh, Paula with the Coconino County Health, and she was saying uh, back to the question around the protocols for centers. Her comment was that a program should have a written pandemic reopening plan that they can be shared with staff and parents that details everything the program is doing to keep both the staff and the children safe at all times and set expectations. So I think that's very important, you know, to be able to, I think it focuses on communication lines with parents and with staff. And we talked about flexibility and adapting to the situation. Um, so I, I think, uh, how about a nice virtual round of applause for both for our speakers, both Cindy and Nicole. Um, if you have further questions or there, you raised a question that we weren't able to cover on the session tonight, uh, you can reach Cindy and Nicole by email by clicking on the envelope icon within the biography box on your screen. I also want to take this time to thank the Arizona Small Business Association for partnering with us on tonight's event. You can go to their website by clicking on the logo at the top of the event page. Uh, for easy access to the Arizona Foundation for Women, you can also click on our logo at the top of the page and you can uh, find information to sign up for our newsletter or, as Andrea said, access information about how to join our social media channels, become a member, a volunteer, or a corporate sponsor. I also want to give a shout out to our AFW staff and our communications team for ensuring that we had a very successful event tonight. And I wanted to mention that following our session tonight, we'll be sending out materials and resources and copies of the slides to all of the reg registered participants. participants sorry. So uh, a big thank you for everyone who joined us tonight and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.